Right. Welcome back, everyone, to the second lecture, BC309, Urban Church Planting. We are talking about um, getting God's heart for the city. So let's continue from where we paused for the break. So we saw Jeremiah 29, verses 7 and 8, where God is saying, um, seek the well-being of the city. Right? Seek God's blessing, God's mercies, God's goodness on the city. And also pray to the Lord for it. Now, I have a question. Question is, how can you pray God's blessing upon sinners? Suppose the city, people are doing bad. So God is saying, seek the peace of the city. City means people only. People are living in a city. Suppose the people are bad. The tendency is God send some judgment. <laughs> send fire and brimstone. Our city needs some fire and brimstone. <laughs> too, <laughs> because people are so bad. People are doing this, doing that. That is our, think, our thought process. How we think. But God has told his people, now remember, this is in Babylon. That means it's uh, it's a corrupt city. It's the place where ne you know Nebuchadnezzar built one big statue and of himself and said, "Worship that." That's the kind of city. And in that kind of city, God is saying, "Seek the peace of the city. Seek the well-being of the city." My question is, how can we do that? On what basis? What is the aspect of God's nature uh, that allows us or motivates us to do that can you think of a verse anything that jesus said that comes to your mind i'm giving you clues now what did jesus say about the father because you know the 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 normal tendency like i said is oh the city is so bad so wicked so god you must judge the city then some storm comes, you say, see, God sent a judgment. Some cyclone comes, God sent a judgment. But those are natural phenomena, and I can't always blame, say that that's the judgment of God. But what's the heart of God? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. Verses 43 to 45. Somebody could read that, please. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. What's the heart of God? What's the nature of God? Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who... Uh, speak spitefully use you and pers persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and saints reign on the just and on the unjust mm. so what is the heart of god or the nature of god and based on that nature of god jesus is telling us love your enemies bless those who persecute you bless those who curse you because this is the nature of god what is god's nature Verse 45, he that you may be sons of your father, he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He gives rain to the just and on the unjust. That means the goodness of God, the mercies of God, the providence of God is for both kinds of people. Right? That does not mean to say that God is not moved by the sin of the city. We already saw that the wickedness of the city comes before him. Right? That means he's moved by that. He doesn't like it. But yet he is good to people. And only when a wickedness is so great that he says, okay, I am going to judge the city. But that is up to God to decide. Not for me to decide. God, now they're really bad. For us, we must be sons of our Father. He makes the sun and the rain to come on the good and the evil. So, so, God, so on that basis, God blessed the city. I know 
uh, not everybody in the city is perfect. I know that. But that's why he needs us to intercede, pray for the city. You have a question, Francis? So, Pastor, my question is regarding the scripture. So, like, uh, who is hate you? Like, love them. That's what uh, God says. And even Jesus is like, uh, love your enemies. And like, if anybody slap you, show the other side. So, my question is like, in case like one person is coming to kill, so we can do the self defense or not? Yeah. So, Jesus taught to preserve our lives. Right? So if we just go to like Matthew chapter 10, just a few chapters down, right? So Matthew chapter 10. Uh, let me give you the exact words. Yeah. Verse 23. Matthew 10, 23. Somebody could read it. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another mm. and other. For assuredly, I say to you, you will have, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before mm. the Son of Man comes. Mm. So what is saying? When they persecute you in this city, flee, run to another. He didn't say sit down there and let's be killed. So if they are coming to kill you. You protect your life, right? So, whatever we need to do to protect ourselves, we should do. So that, uh, of course, we will be useful to God, more useful to God on earth when we are alive than when we are dead. And now we know every person has a time to die. Yes, that is true. But don't die before our time. Live. Preserve your life, live well, so we can be useful to God. And so if they persecute you in one city, you go to the other. That means you're taking care of yourself, you're preserving your life. So to answer your question, if somebody comes, in whatever way we can preserve our life, that is just, that is correct, we should do it. One, if I need to use the law, I'll use it, we can use it. If we need to use uh, self-defense, we'll use it because you're preserving your own life. It's not wrong. If you need to move to another place in order to preserve your life, do it. Why? Because you will be useful to God when you're alive on the earth. Right? From that perspective, right? We're not doing it to harm the other person. We're doing it because, hey, I, I have a work to do. Uh, and nobody's going to stop that. It's also very interesting when you look at the ministry of Jesus with his disciples. In Matthew 10, when he sends them, he says, Don't take two clothes or your purse, your money, or your sword. Leave all that. Because the workman is worthy of his hire. That means wherever you go, whatever people give you, you eat. You stay in their homes in Matthew 10. But before he went to heaven, he called his disciples. This is in Luke, I think Luke 22. He said, in the past, I told you not to take any clothes, not to take any uh, purse, not to take any sword. But now I am telling you, um, I need to find the exact uh, 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 verse. But now I'm telling you, you take money, you take uh, your sword, you take your clothes, because things have changed now. Right? Let me find that. Sorry? Luke? Luke 22. Thank you. Luke 22. Ah, so if you look at that, thank you. Luke 22, uh, verse 35 to 38. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, But now, so that means things have changed. 
But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. Likewise, he who has a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now you take a sword with you. For I say to you that it, that which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So before, when he sent them out, Matthew 10, or Luke 9, he said, don't take anything. Just go. People will take care of you. Uh, you eat whatever they give you, etc., etc. But now, Jesus is going to be crucified. The, the shepherd is going to be struck. The sheep are going to be scattered. Things are going to change. Persecution is going to begin. That happened right from then on, uh, after the church was born. So he says, now you have to take care of yourself. You take whatever you need, including, he says, take a sword. That means you protect yourself. Right? Uh, of course, we don't see Peter, James, and John, you know, walking around in Jerusalem with a sword. But the point is, you protect your life. Right? So, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, coming back here, so what we're saying is we seek the well-being of the city. We pray to the Lord for it, right? And uh, this is where intercession for the city comes in. Lord, you, you, you and I pray for the city. Uh, we see examples in the Old Testament. We see in the New Testament as well. Uh, Paul teaching us to pray for leaders and for those who are in authority. But let's look at some scriptures. Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. Somebody could read it for us, please. Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. Justice is, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot end up. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil make himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that here was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Mm, mm. So. God is looking on the people in the land. He's looking at what is going on. In these two verses, 14 and 15, we are looking at one problem. And the problem here that's highlighted is there is no justice. Truth is not being upheld. Right? So that means people are not being treated fairly. People are being treated unjustly. There is no truth. And notice verse 16. Uh, end of verse 15. The Lord saw it and it displeased him. I mean, God is seeing hey, in this place, nobody is being nobody is being given justice. People are being treated unfairly. Truth is not being upheld. So, you know, I'm just imagining now when people is looking, when God is looking in India and, you know, the, in the last two weeks, this rape case in Calcutta, right? And uh, it's not just Calcutta, but so many places in India. Uh, just today, yesterday, I think, yesterday, two days back, I saw in today's paper, it was... Again, another rape case in UP in the hospital. You're like, hey, this, 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 this thing is happening in Calcutta. It's all news all over. And then in the middle of all that, somebody, another incident. She's saying, okay, God is looking at our nation. I'm just talking about this one problem. Saying he's seeing this problem. And it says, it 
displeased him. So you can imagine God's heart. You know, how is this being affected by what he is seeing happen uh, in our country? Just this one thing. But there's so many other things, so many other things, of course. But there is no truth, there is no justice. Uh, people are being exploited, people are being misused. Uh, you know, you can think about bonded labor, where in many parts of India, uh, people are forced into labor, they can't go out by various means, right? and they're trapped in bonded labor. They have to work, maybe for the rest of their life they have to work in that situation, condition. Uh, so lots of things. And so you can see God's, God is looking at that. There is no justice. There is no truth. And it says, it displeased him. It displeased God. He's not happy. Not happy, what I'm seeing. And then what happens? Verse 16. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no injustice. So he's seeing all this and then he's wondering. He's looking. He saw and he's wondering. He's looking for something in the middle of all this. Is there an intercessor? Is there somebody who is also seeing this and crying out? To me, to God. So he's wondering, is there an intercessor? Now, of course, God is God. He is sovereign. He is powerful. Uh, he can intervene. He will do as he pleases. So it says, uh, his own arm brought salvation, his own righteousness it sustained. So that means God did something. But though God is sovereign, though God is all-powerful, though God is full of majesty, Yet he is looking for an intercessor. That means intercessors are important. And intercessors, because of their prayers, it brings God's intervention into those situations. In this particular case, it says that God himself intervened in spite of there being no intercession. But it's also telling us that intercessors are very important in these kinds of matters, these kinds of situations. Right? So, um, think about that. Right? And that's something we should do as a people, as a church. Right? And we want to bring it back even in our Sunday services. Uh, to keep a little time. We used to do, I mean, I know in other locations we have time for intercession, but in uh, Central we don't because we started eight, go straight. Um, but we want to bring it into the services. So just a little time for the people to intercede, to pray. We used to do it in the before. We used to put a map and we used to pray for the city's state and nation. And so we're going to bring that back. But so that we will intercede, we'll pray. And God is looking for that. Ezekiel 22, Ezekiel 22, 29 to 31. Somebody could read it, please. 29 to 31. The people of the land abused or praised committed robbery and mistreat the poor and needy and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger so i sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that i should not destroy it but i found no one therefore i have poured out my indignation on them i have Consume them with the fire of my word, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. Mm. So, 
again jerusalem what is happening people see god is seeing what the people are doing verse 29 the people are doing all these things they are oppressed they're committing oppression robbery mistreating the poor and needy they wrongfully oppress the stranger verse 30 i sought for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me so that picture that will make a wall stand in the gap that picture is really about um a gap so in in those days in bible times most cities had city walls they had like a fortress around them if the wall of the, not so the wall of the city was very important to protect the people from attack from enemies so the city wall was very important if the city wall in some part has fallen down so there is a gap in the wall then that means the whole city is at risk so that's what it means to stand in the gap that means there's a gap in the city wall that means any we can come people are going to be destroyed so that's the picture here and god is saying i am looking for a man verse 30 i'm looking for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap that means this city its wall is broken down i need somebody to stand and fill the gap protect the city right so literally an intercessor is doing that he's standing in the gap spiritually right there is a natural physical side but this is spiritual side spiritually this city because of the verse 29 because of all the things that are going on this city is open now for spiritual judgment and whatever the devil wants to do he'll do and god himself has to judge these people but he's looking for an intercessor he's looking for somebody to stand in the gap to protect the people on behalf of the people as that's the work of an intercessor and then it says that he was stand on, on stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that i should not destroy it but i found no one that means god's judgment is coming on the city the sins are so great if there was somebody there that could have been averted you know and instead something good could have happened for the people but because there was no one it says in verse 31 god says i have poured out my indignation i poured out my wrath my judgment and i you know they've been paid for their deeds so it's not an unjust thing they've been paid for their deeds but that could have been avoided if there was somebody who was standing and praying you know so we see here that god is looking for intercessors for the city when there is injustice wickedness oppression uh, god is living so that's where we come in right so we seek the well-being of the city we pray to the lord for it and then we also stand as intercessors for the city or for the nation or the region whoever god has called you to lord we pray for these people right uh so now for example uh, we uh, are planning for all our bible college students to serve at north because of all those college campuses there are probably i don't know the correct number but somebody told me there are more than 6000 students in all those colleges around uh, in apc north uh, so when all the students have come the colleges just reopened so more than 6000 students would be there some are day scholars some are boarders and they have these big campuses manipal vidyashal lots of camp, all close to ryan so we decided that we will focus on reaching those students so as we're sending bible college students there we start a 10:30 service we'll do all these things but now what we should do we should start praying for them right start interceding for them right uh we don't know what all will happen inside the campus how students will behave what the, that is okay our job is you pray to pray for the students pray for those campuses you know so that god's mercy god's goodness be poured out on them and most important that they may be saved that they may encounter jesus right so that's how we do it 
and you pray for that reach and you pray for all the campuses i think we made a list of uh, eight or some eight big you know like universities big campuses are there just next to ryan and uh, so that will become a big mission field and these students have come from all over the country they're not just local students they come from all over the country to study so big mission fields so start praying for them lord have mercy on them lord let them make, and we will learn how to pray how to pray for these people but that's the heart of god right he wants us to have that heart and Amos 3, um, let's go to Amos chapter 3, um, verses 3, 7, and 8. Amos chapter 3, verses 3, 7, and 8. Somebody could read that. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, can two walk together unless they're agreed? Verse 7 and 8. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can who can but prophesy? Mm. Right. So verse 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can two people walk together unless they are in agreement? So if we want to walk with God, we have to be in agreement with God. We have to be aligned to his heart. We have to be in tune with his heart. We have to be in agreement with his heart. Right? So if God's heart is looking for intercessors, if God's heart is moved by the injustice, if God's heart is pained by these things, our heart should also be affected by that. And we should be in agreement with God, aligned to God. And then... It says, verse 7 and 8, God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. That means as we are walking together with God, then God begins to reveal things to us. Things that he is going to do and things that he wants to do. He reveals that to us. And then we can't help but prophesy or bring it forth. Right? But we have to walk in agreement with God. And then we will see things happen, things open. I remember, uh, in times past, I was very, I was involved with the youth ministry. Now I'm not so involved. I just spent some time with the youth leaders. But uh, I think this was in, uh, I think it was uh, 2012, some somewhere in those days. Uh, we we used to have our um, every month. We used to have, um, uh, we had these, uh, our youth meetings at Central on a, on a Saturday every month. So now we do pit stop. Now it's called pit stop and it happens, I think, every other month. But those days, uh, we should do every month, we should have this Saturday meeting. Uh, and so, you know, it was just, it was youth service, youth meeting. And we were having that. I think it was 2012 or 2013, I forget the exact year. But I remember one Saturday, uh, during, at the end of the, during the service, at the end of the service, after ministering, we were just praying, suddenly uh, a thought came to my heart. Why don't you take this into college campuses? Because uh, till that time, our youth service was for just our youths. Right. Our youth were coming, they were attending. Um, why don't you take this into the college campuses? Right? So I didn't like, just right then and there, I announced to the young people, uh, they're going to take our youth service, our youth meetings into the college campuses. This is, us. This is what we're going to do. Now, what had happened? At that moment, I just received that thought. It was just an idea. But I, I knew it was God's idea, a thought from God. So I just announced it. You know, I, I didn't have like I didn't go and plan and discuss. Usually I would plan and discuss with the, with the pastoral team. But uh, in that particular moment, I just announced, said, okay, we are going to take this into our college, into college campuses so that we can reach the youth in the campuses. And then I, uh, after announcing it, 
uh, at that moment we never had any plan, nothing. But then I shared with, uh, I, I think I, at that time, I think I did share it with Pastor Nancy Ramya. I think it was, she was the first person. Yeah. I told her, I said, uh, because she was our missions coordinator, I said, okay, you also do this. You, you call college campuses, tell them, you know, we are a church, we want to come into the campus and we want to hold a service for the youth. Uh, thing. And we gave it a name, we called it uh, Campus Elevate or something, we called it. Because the youth services were called Elevate those days. So this was going to be in campus, so we called it Campus Elevate. I said, just tell, call the college, colleges, ask them for permission. Can we, as a church, come and do a Campus Elevate for the students in the campuses? Uh, and, I, and I gave some names. So I said, you know, you can call uh, Baptist Nursing College, call Baldwin's, call these. And so she called. So we had um, Baldwin's Nursing. They said, yeah, please come. Uh, she called Baldwin's Women's College. They said, yeah, please come. Mount Carmel College. They said, yeah, please come. Uh, and uh, I think there was KNN in North. So about five or six colleges just opened up for us. And think about this. Our team would go. I, I never went, but you know, our team, our youth, young people would go. And there would be 200, 300, sometimes uh, in Baldwin's and in Mount Carmel's, like 600 students sitting in the hall, auditorium. No expense for us. Because their auditorium, their PA system, everything is there. They've brought the students in. For us, only our team has to go. Four or five people go. We sing. And we told them, we are from a church. We will share from the Bible. But they told us, you know, don't uh, you know, be too forceful. And, oh, yeah, we'll follow your guidelines. But we'll share some messages that will be useful for the young people. And so what happened? A big door just opened up for us. right? And ev every month, we would at least, you know, we get to literally speak to a few thousand students, right? Just taking this into the campus at almost no expense for us. Yeah. And this continued. We went on doing this. And so we had different people come speak on different topics till the pandemic, you know? So these colleges were open for us till then. When we could go inside the campus every month, they will give us you know, usually on a Saturday or something, a schedule, and the students will come, 600 students sitting in an auditorium, just think about it, you know, and we will, for some, in some colleges, we'll do multiple meetings because one batch of 600, then another batch of another 600. That's how many could sit in the hall, the auditorium, and it was so amazing. Right? I remember once I went to, I was in Delhi, uh, and I, again, I forget the year, but we were doing a conference in Delhi, and uh, in Tiagraj Sports Stadium, uh, and we had, you know, we had a like a room where all the speakers would come. I was monitoring there, and there was one young lady outside standing and waiting. I was like wondering what this is. So I went outside. What happened? They said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. Oh, so she said, I was a nursing college student in Bangalore. I came to study, and the young people from APC used to come and hold campus elevate. My life was changed. My life was touched. I want to come and say thank you. And this in Delhi. I was like, wow, you know, just one testimony like that. You know, she said, thank you for coming. Said, you know, I never went, but the student, young people went. So thank you for APC to come and do this in our campus. You know, her life has changed. Now she's a nurse in Delhi working, serving, but her life has changed. Like that, we don't know how many students, right, who have been affected through the campus celebrity. Now, that was a window. It was an opportunity we had. Then after that, the uh, uh, pandemic came, everything stopped. Anti-conversion law came. Colleges became very, you know, now reserved. Now we are get slowly getting back. Uh, only, I think, one or two colleges have opened. But I'm just thinking um, how when we walk together with God, Amos 3, you know, if you walk together with God, what will happen? He will reveal. He'll tell you something. Sometimes simple idea. Right? It says here, the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret. You know, he reveals what he wants to do, what he's going to do. Just an idea. Small. 
that was I was standing in the youth service. Suddenly, idea came. I just spoke. We are going to do this. I know. And then we went and knocked on the doors. Colleges just opened for us. You know. So like that. When we have the heart of God. And uh, for the city, and we are walking in agreement with God, He gives us these ideas. Do like this. Do like this. It may be a window of opportunity, meaning, hey, do it now. You may not get this opportunity afterwards. So for, from 2012 or 2013 till the pandemic, opportunity was there. Now it's a little difficult. You know, uh, I, as of now, I know only, I think, one or two colleges that are open for us. Slowly things will change, you know, things will change as you print. So schools and colleges will slowly open. But this is a, uh, like God reveals, He gives us instruction, you go do it. He can, he can, you know, uh, uh, make a difference in the lives of people, right? And the other thought I just want to share is, uh, God is much bigger than the city. You know, sometimes when we think about the city, it's easy to get overwhelmed. You know, it's easy to say, "Oh God, this is so difficult. Too much. The problem is too much. It is too complicated. Uh, it is too corrupt. How to handle it?" How do we do anything about it? We can't make a change. It's just so big, you know. Think about, for instance, drug use in the schools. Schools, like from you know, six, seven standard. There are people who are actually pushing drugs into the schools. To you know, of course, they are they are interested in making money, but in the end, children's lives are being destroyed. And it is going into good schools. Like, you know, we thought, oh, these schools will never be affected by drugs they're pushing. So that is such a big problem because it is a big, uh, like a big syndicate, a big uh, business behind this. So you think, oh, God, how are we going to address this? How are we going to solve it? School children are being targeted uh, by these drug peddlers. How? You know, like there's so many problems. So sometimes we can get overwhelmed. So, oh God, this is too much. We can't address it. But we must remember that God is bigger than the city. God is bigger than the, the problem. Right? The nations, Isaiah 14, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. It's like a small drop in a bucket. So for God, it's nothing. So always look at the problem from the eyes of God. You know, whatever problem it is, it could be corruption, it could be uh, prostitution in the city, it could be slums in the city, it could be street children in the city, it could be whatever, whatever problems. Right? Look at it from the eyes of God. The nations are like a drop in a bucket. It can be addressed. We can do something. We have to have the faith and the courage to start addressing it. Right? So let me... Uh, pause here. Let me just close this lesson. So we must get God's heart for the city. Learn to see people in the city as he sees them. Be moved with compassion for people in our city. Pray for our city. And uh, it is interesting that uh, in Luke 19, 11 to 19, the reward for faithfulness in this life is authority over cities in the millennium. It's very interesting to see that. If we are faithful in serving God now, during the millennial reign of Jesus, He's going to give us authority over cities. He's going to help. We are going to actually work with Jesus to bring His kingdom into the cities. So during the millennial reign, these cities will be there. So Bangalore City will still be there. And hey, we will co-labor with Jesus. We'll be heirs together with Christ during the millennium, millennial reign, to administer his kingdom. Natural. Now it's in the spiritual. During the millennium reign, it will be in the literal kingdom on the earth. And we will administer his kingdom in the cities. Right? And the Bible closes, like I mentioned earlier, about this holy city of New Jerusalem, which God himself has built, which will descend on the earth. 
And that city of Jerusalem, I'm just looking at the measurement. And I, I don't know if this is correct, but just my little study. That city of New Jerusalem will be as wide as from going from the east to the west coast of India, like the city, like from Gujarat to Orissa on the other side. The length, the one dimension of the city will be that big, meaning this is not a small city. Right? That's how big the city, one city, the city of Jerusalem will be. Right? We don't know how big the new earth will be, but it will be enough place to hold everybody. <laughs> right? There will be new heavens, new earth. Uh, but the city of Jerusalem is going to be so big, so big. And God himself will be the light of the city. This will be literally the city of the great king. A city that he himself has built. Right? Today, yeah, city of Jerusalem is God's special earthly place. But there's going to be this heavenly city on a new earth where there is no evil. And that's a city God himself has built. So our eternal dwelling is also going to be in a city, a heavenly city. Right? So the point here is that cities are important for God. Right? And uh, we must understand the heart of God, journey with God in doing our part in reaching cities. Okay? So... What we're going to do now, uh, lesson number five from next week, is there are two sections. One is the natural dynamics. That means in the natural, what all things we can do to reach our city. Okay? Natural dynamics. So there will be many lessons on that. Then we will talk about the spiritual dynamics. That means how do you pray for the city? How do you take care of the spiritual things? You know, we want to understand both. Right? So uh, when we talk about the natural dynamics, we'll talk about doing some research for the city, uh, you know, doing a study on the city, and uh, and uh, you know, understanding what's going on. So that will be uh, like some practical work to do. Right? So for example, when you are doing ministry in Bangalore North as Bible college students. You can apply this. You can say, okay, what are the list of make a list of all the colleges? You can go on Google Maps. So now it's very easy. You go on Google Maps, you zoom in. Okay, here's Bangalore APC North, and what are all the colleges around there? And you'll find at least eight colleges over there, big campuses. So you look okay. These are called. Then you can go in and so what are these campuses? Where are these students from? Uh, make do a little study, you know, so that and see where, what do the students do in the evenings or in the afternoons. Uh, you walk around those areas, see where they are. What? How can we reach them? You know, see these are all natural things you can do in the in the natural. Uh, uh, so the, understand the dynamics of the area you're going to reach. Right? So we will go through some practical things that you can do. And as students, you can apply this to Bangalore North. Right? Hey, we can do this. Let's do some study. And these days, because of tools that we have, it makes it very easy. Right? Sitting here, you can zoom in Bangalore North on Google Maps. You can do a full study. What all is there around uh, you know, uh, APC North. And then you can actually go physically, survey. Where, what do students do? Where are they hanging out? Uh, what are their problems? Then come up with strategies, how to reach them. Right? That's all in the natural. So very, very strategic approach we can take. And, uh, and then we can look at it from a spiritual side. How do we pray and so on. Right? So the natural dynamics, the spiritual dynamics uh, that we will cover as we go forward. So for next uh, week, uh, Pastor Paul Emmanuel will continue. I'll let him know uh, he can start from chapter 5. Uh, let me pause and take questions. Any questions here so far? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you give the mic to Prince? Uh, sorry, Francis. Yeah, Francis. 
so like uh, basu you share your experience uh, on the first class like how you start planning and how was your experience before you come to the bangalore and what after mm. the coming to the bangalore how you start and how the growth of the church so like how you planned for the bible college how mm. you start the ministry yeah so the bible college um i would say the inspiration for this of course uh i knew that uh of a main uh, one of our one of the aspects of god's call is for us to equip people but when we were in the us and i mentioned one church a victory christian center in tulsa i saw that the church was running a bible institute so that was like an inspiration that the church can actually run a bible college and then i also uh, i had a friend who was a minister uh, older to me but of course and he was running bible colleges he was running a bible college in um, fiji uh, and in indonesia so um i went and taught in those colleges so i had a little exposure oh how he's running uh the bible college in fiji and also in indonesia so i had a little exposure okay this is how it's being done here and i also um uh, there was another ministry here in in, in bangalore called eternal light ministries um, sam taylor uh he was running a short term bible college so it was of four months so it was not a full fledged four months he was running it in raikota and in those days which was um, maybe in the uh, um 90s 2000 early 2000 it was very very i would say like well known people used to come from all over india to study in raikota short term bible college raikota is in tamil nadu and so i had gone and i taught there on maybe two times in the early days in the 90s and i saw how he was running it so it was very very basic but uh, he was doing it in multiple languages different rooms students from different countries you will speak in english translation into hindi then in every room people will be translating immediately that speaker will be connected and they will be translating in all so many languages and people come and it was only four months fully res residential it was very effective because residential so i saw that i got some ideas um and so i knew in my heart that one of the things we will do after we start apc in bangalore is also start a bible college i had already been thinking about this but i was learning from all these different experiences teaching in these different bible colleges i was learning right uh, okay you can do like this and so on and then after we came to bangalore uh in 2001 2002 there was a there were a group of american missionaries uh who had come um they were from some ministry in california or something they had started a work here and they came they actually had a bible college running here in bangalore uh and so i um, and and they used to bring all their students to apc so this was i think in 2001 2 3 for from 2001 till 2003 they used to bring their students to come and study i mean attend apc services and they also invited me to uh, come and teach in their bible college so i did that again i saw how they had set things up here in bangalore but in 2003 they closed and they went like everything wrapped and and they gave us like a lot of the books that you see in our uh, uh study center was actually their books they gave they gave the whole library to us they said they can't take it back they gave it to us uh, they gave a lot of cassette tapes and all, all of that is we got rid of but but anyway so through all these experiences i learned about you know okay this is how it is uh, and then uh in those days uh, i i prepared um, our own curriculum and we had started sorry and i'm over time just take 2 minutes uh, we started uh, those days we started what we call a school of ministry this was before bible college 
school of ministry where I would teach these topics, but on a Saturday, once a month, Saturday, three hours, we would do these topics. Some of our lecture notes actually started there. You know, I, I wrote those lecture notes for school of ministry, like prayer and intercession, evangelism, different topics, believers authority, all those things. Those were the lecture notes I used. And I would teach every Saturday, not every Saturday, once a month, three hours, school of ministry. So we started that just to see if people will come. And there were people coming and attending that from different churches. It was not just only APC. Small group, about 10, 15 people will come and attend. So I thought, yeah, people are open to this. So that was like the starting point. But that helped me prepare all the topics. So I put down maybe like 16 topics or something. And then from that, we started Bible College in 2005. So it kind of expanded, all right. Um, we will do these topics. We'll cover it over two years. We'll do it like semester, uh, and we will do these notes. And so that's how it started. But of course, the plan was to make it like a proper Bible college. That is, at some point, we'll have our own. I wanted it to be like a big, like our own campus, all of that. So again, as we were visiting different places, we look at you know what are good campuses, how how it looks, and so on. So all those ideas we collect. And, and now it's slowly come, you know, we have land now. Maybe in two years from now, we'll have our own facility. We'll have three years of Bible college. Then from there, we can grow. Like if you want to do master courses, masters, all those things we can offer, right? We can become more well-established. Yeah. So it's slowly. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll close. And uh, Pastor Paul will continue this next week. Thank you. Bye now.